They are not Muslims, they are monsters. After an emergency COBRA meeting this morning, the Foreign Secretary said all forms of response are up for consideration. Any aggression towards the Islamic State is an aggression towards Muslims. Breaking news that we're getting from the Foreign Office who say they are aware of a video purporting to show the beheading of the British worker David Haynes. Americans are repulsed by their barbarism. We will not be intimidated. A man with a pitch-perfect British accent has brought a far-off conflict right to our doorstep. Britain is waking up to an uncomfortable reality. Events that seem far away have roots much closer to home. The killer believed to be responsible for the death of British aid worker David Haynes is this man, the apparently British IS fighter gaining notoriety for a series of gruesome hostage beheadings in the Middle East. It's now estimated that 500 British Muslims are fighting abroad with groups including IS. But what role are they really playing and why? We traveled across Britain to find out. Shahid Butt has been watching events in Syria play out from his home in Birmingham. But in the 1990s, he became a foreign fighter himself in another conflict, when Bosnian Muslims were dying in the Balkans. So I'm handing out food packs, handing out food packs, handing out, and I'm getting quite, you know, I'm quite happy, you know, that I'm doing something good. As I came out of the classroom, I looked down the corridor and there was a whole row of women with their children who hadn't received anything. And I had to walk past all of them. And even though I didn't understand the language, but those mothers and those children were all looking into my eyes and I knew what they were saying to me. They were saying, well, what about us? And at that moment, I remember saying to myself, I've got no money, I've got no food, but I can fight. I'm going to fight for you. In 1999, he was jailed for terrorist offences in Yemen. The mountain is not safe at the moment. Fifteen years terrorists. on, this generation of British Muslims fighting abroad are now considered a potential terrorist threat to the UK. Yet Britain has been arming some rebel groups and has publicly stated its desire to see President Assad overthrown. These young men, who spoke from Syria last year, say that's a double standard. I don't have any plans to wage jihad or any kind of fighting in the UK. When the conflict happened in Syria, and there wasn't anyone coming here to save people's lives or even help them. But once people like me came and no one else did, somehow we got labelled as terrorists. I mean, how did that happen? It's images like these that they say prompted their involvement in a conflict that's already affected more than nine million people and where no form of warfare has been out of bounds. Many Muslims in the UK share this sense of injustice. Rapper Kash Chowdhury has turned to music to express his frustration at the way Muslims are sometimes labelled. He says distrust runs so deep, some even question whether the beheading of American journalist James Foley really happened. There's no trust in the media. I mean, there's a huge percentage of Muslims who just feel that the whole, everything that happens is a hoax, is a setup. And then you've got the other side, which is blaming everything on Muslims. I mean, James Foley, uh, who's died now, I mean, we've built up his character. It's very sad what happened to him, but like James Foley, we know his history, what, he, what who he was, his parents have spoken. He's got an identity, emotional attachment, whereas the ones who die from the, should we say, the other side, the Muslims, the Iraqis, the Syrians, the Afghans, the Pakistanis, they're just uh, left dying in shallow graves with no name. So that huge sense of injustice definitely contributes to people being radicalised. People from England, Jews from England, join, go to Israel to fight with the IDF. They have British passports. They work for British companies. And they go and they fight for the IDF in Israel. Nobody says anything about them. But there is a minority seeking violence. IS is sometimes described as an extension of gang culture, attracting members from inner cities around the world. In Middle East, home in Syria. Their recruitment strategy plays on popular video games, speaking to disillusioned young people in a language they understand. You've got a nine, eight, nine, ten-year-old child playing those kind of violent, you know, games with heads blowing off and limbs blowing off. What kind of a, what kind of a, what, what kind of a mentality is that kid going to have? You've dehumanized that person. To go and fight in Syria is as easy as going on holiday to Disneyland. Because you've made it simple. 
They go onto social networks, they go onto Facebook, they go onto Twitter, they link up with people, they find out the routes, they find out contacts, they get met at places, they do it all online. The most comprehensive survey of the social media profiles of British fighters in Syria to date has found a growing number of teenagers and women. There's the idea that there's a genocide going on of the Sunni people of Syria that is being carried out by Bashar Assad, Iran, Hezbollah, now the Iraqi government too, and that their Sunni brothers and sisters need to be defended and saved. On the other hand, since June and since the declaration of the caliphate, the self-declared caliphate, there's also been a lot of excitement about this idea of being part of an Islamic state. For filmmaker Bilal Abdul Karim, who's been embedded with rebels fighting in Syria, it's a potent recruitment tool for groups like IS. I have met um, uh, uh, quite a few British fighters, and some of them have decided to go over to the ISIS side. And um, uh, yes, they're there. When they become uh, inundated with these uh, fancy videos, the promise of an Islamic State, then somewhere in there, they their sense of reason uh, gives way, that's when that starts to take over and that's when it goes into the direction of being uh, extreme. But there are some who are completely out of their depth and want to come back, having realized their involvement was not what they thought it would be. Hanif Kadir, who himself went to fight in Afghanistan a decade ago, now works with young people facing radicalization. He believes not allowing them back could ultimately increase the threats to the UK. If we don't have a, a corridor for the individuals to come back, obviously in a, in a managed way, um, it's only a matter of time where they have to then, they've got no choice but to go back and sign up to ISIS. We don't want to be facing a scenario where we've got to be concerned about the 500 wanting to come back for revenge because we didn't allow them back in a controlled fashion. I think we need to have some checks and balances, certainly, but I think that corridor needs to remain open. The young people Hanif works with in East London have turned their backs on extremism, but do have a strong sense of injustice. As a Muslim, when another Muslim is being oppressed, we're supposed to feel that oppression, we're supposed to feel the same pain as a Muslim. And I, I feel the same pain, but I know there's other things that I can do, whereas an, another individual, he'll, he, he will react to this in a manner of, okay, I need to do something to help my oppressed brothers and sisters in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan or Palestine, wherever. And they feel like that nothing's being done, so they've got to do something. So they'll buy that plane ticket to Syria and, or Iraq and they'll go and support uh, an ideology which they think um, is doing, like ISIS, or they'll think that they are doing the right thing. But is the distinction between humanitarian work and taking up arms always clear-cut? Charity Children in Dean's efforts to send emergency aid to Syrian refugees have been hindered by the actions of one volunteer. In 2013, six months after taking part in one of their convoys, Abdul Wahid Majid became one of the first suicide bombers in Syria. He had nothing to do with that organisation. He was a volunteer travelling on his own free will. Um, six months after, he decided to do whatever he'd done. You know, we'd done all our checks, we'd done our vetting, we got in touch with the Border Control, we gave them the names of all the volunteers, we filled out all the forms, we'd done our due diligence and our risk assessments, and we'd done whatever we could. We, we've had, you know, members of uh, a counter-terrorism unit, MI5, getting in touch with our volunteers, our trustees, and, you know, just uh, treating us as criminals as such, you know. It's the belief that Muslims who are simply trying to help in a humanitarian crisis are being criminalised that's fueling an already festering sense of demonisation. It's a bank holiday Monday in Blackburn, a former textile town in Lancashire with a large Muslim community. At this wedding, there's anger that British Muslims are in any way associated with the actions of groups like IS. We condemn this ourselves. We, we're yeah. completely against it. You know what? I live in this country. We absolutely, I lo absolutely love this country from the bottom of my yeah. heart. I'm so proud to be a British, British Muslim. I don't want to just say British. I don't want to say Muslim. I'm proud to be a British Muslim. And I would just wish people would understand that we're not with these people. This small minority, they, they don't represent Islam. They don't represent Islam at all. It's the combined effect of feeling discriminated against and needing to build a new future as British Muslims 
that has the potential to create an identity crisis for the descendants of people who moved to this country decades ago. Back in northwest London, Cash Chowdhury wrote P A K I. As a response to his feelings of alienation. Now it's ridiculous that like, the new generation they're still not feeling British. I mean, how long have they, they were talking about people Bangladeshis and Pakistanis for my they've been here for 60, 70 years and this now kids are still saying I'm not British. Now we're getting to emergency point and Britain needs to take responsibility in that because you can't just say oh, look at these Asians and these Muslims, they don't integrate, they're so, uh, they're so stuck in their ways. No, because it's not like that. Uh, if you go to Canada, if you go to the USA, if you go to South Africa, the Asians are integrated. Feeding into the lack of security about who they are and what they believe are difficulties understanding Islam, a religion taught in a language many don't speak. Islam is a very, very powerful tool. Yeah, it's a very, very powerful thing. Now... And the only analogy I can think of is like a nuclear bomb. If you put a nuclear bomb into the hands of a little kid without any understanding, you're going to have a disaster. So that's why, you know, Islam... That, you see, in Islam, we have checks and balances. You know, we have scholars. What you've got now is, is everybody's a scholar. You know, we call them, you know, Mufti Googles. You know, they're all on Google now. They're all Google scholars. You know, and everybody's arguing and debating and, and, and criticizing with people. Where would you get your knowledge from? All from Google. You know, so, the, and, and, and unfortunately, the gap is there. This young Londoner says his understanding of Islam has countered the allure of groups like IS. But that hasn't stopped him from wanting to go to Syria. Recently, I've been thinking about going to Syria or Iraq on humanitarian purpose because I see, like I said, we love our, our religion. I want to go there and help people. When I'm going there, I know there's a chance I'm not going to come back, but I'm doing the right thing. That's all that matters. It's ironic that the constant focus on radicalization has angered so many, and has perhaps done more than anything else to isolate a whole new generation of British-born Muslims. One consequence is the appeal of groups like IS, but far more widespread is a gradual disengagement from the rest of society, which raises the question, what does the future hold for the UK if Muslims who are British feel anything but?